All right. So when you're driving, eventually you're going to get a situation where a bug slams into your windshield. Um, the question is, which force is greater, the force of your car on the bug or the force of the bug on your car? Any thoughts on this? Bug on the car. Car on the bug. Yes? Maybe equal. So it's definitely one of those three answers. And this is a question that we'll be answering closer to the end of class. So don't worry, you will get the answer to this. Um, in order to understand the answer to that question, though, we have to understand something, is that when you exert a force, there's always another force that's also being created. Usually it's just as a reaction to the force that you're making. Forces come in pairs. And I know this for a fact because I have several pairs in my desk. And I know for sure that forces come in pairs. Because as you can see, there they are. It says forces. Does that make some sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> Was this not a good use of an afternoon right here? <laughs> Darn right. I actually got another one too. In case you missed the first show, forces come in pairs. And that's what Newton's third law is all about, and that's what we're going to be spending the entire class time on today. So uh, let's go ahead and just kind of jump into what this means. When we're talking about Newton's third law, you know it as the, the Newton's law of motion where every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. But the real question is, what does that really mean? We've been drawing force diagrams and force equations all over the place here. How does that tie into everything that we've done so far? Um, we know for sure, I talked about this briefly at the beginning of this chapter, that if I'm putting 100 newtons of force on this table by pushing it, it's putting 100 newtons of force back on me. That, oh, go ahead, that's fine. If it breaks off its bearings and starts going across the room, it's still putting 100 newtons of force back on me. And, um, of course, it is moving in this direction, and we're going to see exactly why it still moves if those forces are equal uh, later on in the class. So hang on for that. Um, that is coming. So yeah, whenever you're putting a force on something, there's an equal force put on you. And to just kind of demonstrate this a little bit further, um, I need a volunteer. Thank you. Come on back with me. So if I were to put this in a force diagram, here's what it would look like. And you'll have to take notes. Um, you can label your notes um, Newton's third law today. So there's me. I'm excited to be on the skateboard and to be pulled. Uh, so the question is basically what would the force diagram look like for this scenario? So gravity's going down. 
as always, we've got a normal force going up. There's probably some friction, and we'll do it for the very beginning, when I was being pulled to the right. So if I was being pulled and I was moving to the right, there would be some friction going to the left, because friction's always going to be there. We also noticed that as Trey was pulling me, I was picking up speed. So that means that whatever force is going to the right must be larger than whatever's going to the left. So I would call this my tension force. Now, in reality, this is what we would do for just me, but I'm not just concerned with myself anymore. Because when we're dealing with Newton's third law, we're dealing with two separate objects, or in this case, two separate very good-looking people. And so if we we're going to put force diagrams on for two different objects, we have to take a couple more things into account. Namely, we've got to draw a tray into this. So he was pulling me to the right. And there's a couple forces that are acting on Trey as he's doing this. I should give him some hair. There we go. And he's got a normal force going up. And he's pulling me to the right. Now, as he's pulling me to the right, um, Trey, did you feel a force from me on you? Uh, I'm going from that table up there. Yeah, exactly. So as he was pulling me this way, I was kind of resisting that motion. It took some effort for him to actually pull me in that direction. And so in the same way that he was exerting a force on me, I was exerting a force on him. And we're going to actually label these things a bit differently than a tension force. And here's where this is going to change. What's that? You were writing what? Oh, I'm sorry. You can just put a little X over it. Because uh, this normally is a tension force for one object. But if I'm being pulled by somebody and I have to take them into account, what we're going to call this force, I'll call this the force of Trey on Mr. Hathaway. So this is what our tension force used to be. And I suppose you could just put an H after it. <laughs> now, because he's also feeling a force, kind of that resistance force that I'm providing as he's trying to pull me, that force is in the opposite direction. What do you suppose we call that force? Yeah, force of Hathaway on Trey. And if we wanted to put friction in, friction would also be going to the left uh, for, for Trey there. But the main thing that Newton's third law is saying is that the force of Trey on Mr. Hathaway is equal to the force of Mr. Hathaway on Trey. And that's all we're talking about for Newton's third law for these action-reaction pairs. I need another volunteer who does not want to kill me. Thank you. That was nice and fast. It's always fun when I ask that. No one answers for all well, 10 seconds. <laughs> all right, Alexa. You're going to have to get behind me, and you're going to be pushing me. Yep, yep. You're going to be pushing me in this direction. Yep, straight ahead, trying to have it be like a constant push. Don't worry about me falling. I have health insurance. For you. Thank you very much. diagram, considering what uh, we now know about action-reaction forces. And it's going to be pretty much the same thing. 
Alexa has a little bit different hair, but uh, so I was still being pushed to the right, and there's still friction to the left. So this is a new force diagram you can draw. Gravity's still going down, normal force is going up, friction's to the left, and I'm being pushed to the right. So normally, I would label this force as being an applied force. But because we're dealing with Newton's third law, we're going to label it something different, and that is going to be the force of, you want, you want L for Lexa or A for Alexa figures? All right. Force of Lexa on Hathaway is what we're going to label that force. Actually, all right, when you draw this, just know that I guess the positions are flipped now because this is where Trey was pulling me from the right. Lexa is pushing me from the left, so her picture would actually be over here. But you get the idea. And she was happy when she was pulling, and she's got some nice hair. I suppose it doesn't go in front of your face. Yeah. There we go. Splitting image. So uh, she's pushing me to the right, and uh, as she's pushing me to the right, just like with Trey, I'm exerting kind of a resistance to that motion. And we would call that resistance the same thing we called it last time. The force of Mr. Hathaway on Lexa. Gravity's down, normal force is up. If there was any friction, it would also be to the left because that would be opposing the direction of the motion. And so once again, all Newton's third law is saying is that the force of Lexa on Mr. Hathaway is equal to the force of Mr. Hathaway on Lexa. And that's all there is to Newton's third law. It's not nearly as deep or as complicated as the second law or the first for that matter. Uh, but yeah, questions on Newton's third law. Okay, just a couple extra things uh, as we go forward with this then. So just to kind of answer that question uh, about the bug in the windshield, let's say that we have a collision where an apple hits the wall. I would say that the force of the apple on the wall is equal to the force of the wall on the apple. Or if you want to sound like Dr. Seuss, you could use a ball as an example. Force of the wall on the ball is equal to the force of the ball on the wall. And the other way around. Um, so all these things are always going to be the exact same. And it's kind of easy to understand it that way. But if you think about it, let's be honest. If you're driving in a Prius and you go head-on with a semi, who's going to win that battle? The semi is going to win. You're going to be in heaven, and the semi driver is going to be just fine. So the question is, how can we have these same forces when we've got such vastly different results? Um, the, the semi driver might not even tell that he, that he hit you. He'll be just fine. But how is it possible that the force of the Prius on the semi is equal to the force of the semi on the Prius when we've got these hugely different outcomes? Uh, and this ties directly into the bug and the windshield. If this is true, if Newton's third law is actually correct, it would mean that the force of the bug on the windshield is equal to the force of the windshield on the bug. And so the question is, is that really true? How many people believe that the force of the bug on the windshield is equal to the force of the windshield on the bug? Raise your hand. That's over half. That's good. And that is actually 100% true. So, what's that? They are equal. So go ahead, write down that answer, and I'll work on making sense of that, because obviously we've got two hugely different results. You'd rather be the, the windshield as opposed to the bug in this scenario. So, we'll yeah, try and reckon. Like, like, the windshield would have a greater force because it's 
Uh, well, it all depends on how you define force. And that's what we're going to do right now, and this is all going to make sense then. <laughs> and it was a good question. So two objects, when they interact, will always um, perform equal forces on each other. Every time, all the time. Whether you're talking about a ball on a wall, a semi hitting a Prius, or a bug hitting a windshield. And this all comes in when we start to think about how exactly we're defining force. We define force by Newton's second law as F equals ma. Now, m is mass. It's how much mass and how heavy something is, generally. Acceleration is basically a measurement of how quickly your speed or your velocity is changing. The faster you're accelerating, the faster you're picking up speed or slowing down. So let's think about this in terms of the bug and the windshield. Let's think about the force of the windshield. And we'll we can just talk about it in terms of the car itself. So I'll just label this car. Force of the car. What's the force? What does F stand for? What does what stand for? Mass. Yeah, mass and acceleration. <laughs> Force is equal to your mother. <laughs> oh, I call my dad Pa. I don't think we have an equation with Pa in it. Although P is generally momentum. We'll have to think of one. So in terms of the car, um, would you say that compared with the bug, the mass of the car is big or small? Yeah. Big. Big. Huge. <laughs> but when that car hits that bug, it's reacting only a tiny, tiny bit. Its speed is changing, but not even big enough to measure. So the acceleration is extremely small. Yeah. So now let's think about the force that the bug is experiencing. The mass of the bug in relation to the car is tiny, super tiny. But when you compare the acceleration or the change in speed or velocity that that bug undergoes compared with the car, it is just enormous. It has a huge acceleration. And so in the end, these ratios cancel each other out, and you end up with the exact same force. So Newton's third law is absolutely true all the time. So in the end, if you don't want to die under these conditions, you want to have the bigger mass. It's the acceleration, the change in speed, that kills you. That's okay. I was about to say, like, if, like, you were trapped, like, in a car, like, with a train coming towards you. <laughs> yeah. But that's not, that's not a very good life. No, it is. It's the acceleration that kills you. You're going from zero to however fast the train's going in a split second. And it's, it's, that's why you're going to die. It's that quick change in speed. So F equals MA and Newton's third law would apply to that scenario as well. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't they have the bigger mass yeah. and the bigger acceleration if you were just sitting there, though? Well, the, the train would have the bigger mass, and it would have a smaller acceleration, because it's not going to change speed hardly at all. But if you're sitting there in your car, comparatively, you've got a smaller mass and a bigger acceleration. So, yeah, um, just to kind of check to see how much you really believe this, let's say that I have my special physics hammer here, and I put my hand on the table. Don't do that. Why would you do that? But I mean, the force of the hammer on the hand should be equal to the force of the hand on the hammer, right? You said you will. It's still gonna hurt. Still gonna hurt. So that's. Yeah, the force doesn't mean like. Okay. What if I use this end? Stop. 
That'd be worse? That'd be worse. Yeah, I probably would. It is my left hand, though. Oh, yeah, I suppose not. You have a child. That's true. You're the baby. <laughs> so yeah, even if I would smash and bludgeon my hand with a hammer, Newton's third law would still apply. The force of the hammer on the hand would be equal to the force of the hand on the hammer. Another example. Let's say you've got a fancy little helicopter thing here. Let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, you'll hear the squeak noise, believe me. Got it. All right. So helicopters also undergo Newton's third law. <laughs> the force of the wind on the propellers is equal to the force of the propellers on the wind. Every time you've got two things acting, you've got two forces uh, acting on each one like that. Uh, so yeah, Newton's third law. What we're going to do next is just kind of go over a couple examples from the homework, and hopefully you should be good to go then. Yeah, homework? Yeah. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Well, that was just that time. There's a time for everything. Are we having a final in this class? Yes, the final is uh, the question that we have at the beginning of the day. Really? Oh! Yeah. <laughs> Yep, I mentioned that quite a bit at the beginning of the year. But I yeah, there. I No, no, these questions are are the final, so you okay. should know exactly what's going to be on there, and they're in multiple Perfect. choice form. So. So if you think you're missing some, it would probably do you well to find somebody who has not missed any and compare, make sure that uh, make sure that you have them all. So the best thing we can do with this homework is just go over one or two together and then I'll turn you loose. Let's take a look at problem number two. Basically what we're doing is drawing all the forces on each block and uh, taking Newton's third law into account here. So in number two, no comment. In number two, um, we've got B and A. We're supposed to draw block A and its force diagram on the right and uh, block B and its force diagram on the left. So for number two, I'll draw block B over here. And there's a couple things about block B. We've got gravity going down. I'll say force of gravity on B. Yeah, yeah, so block B is to the left of the picture there. Normal force is up. And if you look at the picture, block B is being pushed by block A, which is being pushed by a finger. So we do have to take friction into account here. Because block B is being pushed to the left, that means we're going to have some friction to the right. Are we drawing like a separate picture? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm doing your I was just doing it. Yeah, these pictures are going to go to the left of the scenario that you're looking at for block B. And then for block A, they're going to go to the right. So you can kind of, here's my answer key, you can kind of see where they go. So for number two, block B goes over here, block A goes over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now block B is being pushed to the left uh, because of block A, so it's got a force to the left, and I would call that the force of A on B. And that would be all you need for block B. Block A is extremely similar. So block A 
is then going to the right of the scenario on the worksheet. You've got gravity going down. We've got normal force going up. Block A also has some friction going to the right, opposing that motion. Yep. Questions on the diagram up to this point? Okay, so once we're here, now we've got two more forces left. Um, so, number one, it's pushing on block B, and because of that, block B is kind of pushing back on A. In the same way that when uh, Lexa was pushing me, I was sort of pushing back on her as a reaction to that. And so... Block A has a force from block B. It's kind of going this way, the force of B on A. And in addition to all of that, there's actually a finger pushing block A. So that's a legit applied force, and that's going to be going to the left. And that's number two. Questions on this? Well, um, I'm not going to answer that question here because it's all... I want to see what everybody comes up with for that. If you have the, the right force diagrams, try and work your way through, see what answers you get for those. We'll talk about those answers tomorrow. Force diagrams are the most important part of this. Now... Um, number two is being pushed with a constant velocity. So what that means technically, and you don't have to make these perfect length, but if we have a constant velocity to the left, that means that this force should be equal to the combination of these two. So if you want to get real specific, you could try and make this arrow be twice as long as, as those two, so that in the end they'd be the same left and right. Um, but yeah. If, if it was accelerating, if it was picking up speed to the left, then this arrow would technically be bigger than the combination of these two. But you don't have to worry about that. Just have the right arrows in the right directions. That's the main thing. The other one we should go through is, let's do number 9. Because 9 is my favorite number, and um, it's a different example. It's good to look at something where we've got tension instead of an applied force here. No, just if you've got a bigger mass, you should have a larger arrow for the force of gravity. But that's about all. And I suppose a larger force of friction, too. But the main thing, again, is that you have the right arrows in the right places. So, letter B, then, on the left is bigger than A. So we've got ourselves a force of gravity here. Nothing too surprising there. Normal force, same as what we're used to. And in number nine, block B is being pulled to the right. So if it's being pulled to the right, that means we're going to have friction to the left. And it's connected to block A with a string. So it's really block A that's pulling it to the right. So um, this would be the force of A on B. Yep, absolutely fab. Questions on block B? So then there's block A. Block A also has a force of gravity. It's not going to be as big because the block isn't as big. Same with normal force. And uh, because it's also moving to the right, there's going to be friction to the left.
And as block A is being pulled to the right, block B is providing some resistance to that in the same way that I was providing resistance to Trey when he was pulling me across the floor. And so block A is feeling that, and we would call that the force of B on A. And finally, block A is actually being pulled by a a string that's going to the right. So we would just go ahead and call that our tension force. Yeah, the only difference between the two is um, number eight, you've got smaller masses. So here your force of gravity might be a little bit smaller for number eight. Um, but the only other thing I want to point out about number nine is uh, because we have a constant acceleration, we're picking up speed, that means that the forces to the right have to be bigger than the forces to the left. So again, it doesn't really matter to me. As long as you've got the right forces in the right directions, that's the main thing I'm looking for. But if you really want to be specific about it, this arrow then should be bigger than the combination of these two, and this arrow should be bigger than whatever's going to the left it's accelerating to the right. Uh, so that's the main idea there. Questions on this at all? Okay. So to just kind of wrap this up, you know, the question kind of at the beginning was, you know, if, if this table comes off its moorings and I push it, how is it possible that it could be exerting the same amount of force on me as I am on it? And the answer to that question is basically friction. You know, it's putting the same amount of force on me, but if I'm successfully moving it, then there's more friction on my feet than the friction on, on this object. So the forces are still the same, but if there's less friction here than on me, that's why it's moving. Um, so yeah, it all comes down to friction under those conditions. A uh, little bit about what's happening the rest of this week then. Uh, Tomorrow, we're going to go through and just take a look at worksheet number three. Uh, in addition to that, we're going to kind of have a bit of a review day, a uh, full-on review day on Thursday, and we'll have ourselves a test on this stuff on Friday. So the good part about the test on this section is, like I mentioned for some of the other sections, uh, we've been spending a lot of time on the difficult parts of this stuff. And the difficult parts of this stuff will be on one page of the test, but the other three are mostly going to be multiple choice. Uh, and we'll talk more about that on Thursday. But try not to worry yourselves too much about that. Uh, we'll be starting kind of our review session on Wednesday, uh, full-on review session on Thursday.